So prayer in brokenness. We need to be on the same page as God. That's the point. If we're on the same page as God, then we c- we're able to see and know his blessing. When we cry out to him in our troubles and our brokenness, he brings us close to him. And most all of you know this. We've been looking together at the subject of prayer with a series called Prayers That Change Everything. We know that prayer changes things, and we know that as we pray, God leads us or speaks to us. We've, these are the subjects that have been covered the last couple of messages. We don't understand any of this because God is beyond our comprehension that he should change things when we pray and that he should speak to us in ways that people who don't know him don't comprehend what we're talking about. A few through history have heard his actual voice like you're hearing mine, but all of us who know him know that he speaks to us and it's when we quiet ourselves and we pray and he changes things. And today we're thinking about prayer in our brokenness and for our brokenness. So how is it that God uses our brokenness to bring us in line with him and his will? Even our brokenness is one of those changes that we're talking about. Because as we come to him, he changes us to be broken properly. What is brokenness? And let me just say that when you look at the leaders of your church, right here, I don't need to name them, but you look at them, they are probably some of the most broken people. That's who God makes as leaders. Broken for different reasons in different ways through trials, Brokenness is a part of our relationship with God all along the way. What is it? So right in the beginning, right in the very beginning of our relationship, there's brokenness because we've been going our own way. God breaks through our pride and our stubborn sin with the gospel of grace and forgiveness and a future with him. And we're broken as he turns us around. That's the beginning of our brokenness. Our repentance as we cry out to God, turning from sin to trusting in him because of his death for our sins and because of his resurrection, that's brokenness. You might say it's like the breaking of a horse. A cowboy or a cowgirl breaks a horse. A wild horse wants to do whatever the horse wants to do. The cowboy makes the horse useful by gently bringing the horse around to where the horse can be saddled and can become what seems like a friend to the cowboy and becomes a friend with the cowboy. The horse now becomes gentle and useful. And you might say this is what God is doing when he brings us gently to repentance where we become useful. Barb and I know several cowboys and cowgirls in Montana. There may be some cowboys and cowgirls around here. We don't know them here, but we knew them in Montana. One of the cowboys we know is a professional horse trainer. He's got an indoor arena, and uh, we got to watch him with a horse once or twice, gently bringing the horse around to learn to take the commands and to be useful. It's really something. It's an art. And the horse is broken. He was paid a lot of money to do that. The horse and everyone else is benefited when the horse is broken properly. Comparing this to us, all the pride and the arrogance of going our own way, which is always a way of stubbornness and every kind of sin to get our way, Uh, will lead us to an end away from God 
and in agony for eternity, and God wants us to be near him and to enjoy eternity. We are like all of the negative characteristics of a wild horse. Kicking and stomping and, you know, running our own way. Now, after the horse is broken, he can still enjoy running around the pasture or the meadow or the mountain, but he comes when called. And he enjoy, the horse enjoys the cowboy, and the horse is useful. The horse is still the horse. We're still the people. And the freedom that the horse had before has still got freedom, but now he's uh, useful. So our hearts need to be broken, and our stubbornness needs to be broken and turned into useful perseverance as we now steadfastly follow Jesus. The most stubborn people are the most persevering people when they give it to God. Anything that's in our, anything that's in our character before we come to Christ is changed. And so now we are stubbornly following Jesus, you might say. But then if we try to go our own way, which every one of us does, we're broken again. And we're broken again by his powerful love and truth breaks through to us. The relationship continues as God, through everything that happens to us, trains us lovingly to trust him and to remain humbly broken of our pride. You don't see a leader in the church that has not been humbly broken of their pride. And the more broken, the more we see the leaders because they give their lives to Christ and they become leaders. I think of Peter and how he was a strong-willed man, like a wild horse, and as he grew in knowing Jesus, he was continually broken to become the godly leader of the early church, filled with the spirit of gentleness and meekness and self-control and perseverance, steadfastness, and he just remained strong in every good way. Peter was strong. And he remained strong and got stronger in every good way. I sometimes think about the time when Peter denied Jesus three times, and Luke puts it a certain way that gives us an understanding of the brokenness we can all experience when we know Jesus as Peter knew him. And in Luke 22, 54, it says, Then seizing Jesus, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest, Peter followed at a distance, and when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them, and he could see Jesus, by the way. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, this man was with him, but Peter denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. That's prideful and arrogant and going his own way. A little later, someone else saw Peter and said, you also are one of them. Peter said, man, I'm not. About an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him, for he's a Galilean. And Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. And so here's the part where Peter is broken. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. So this is the kind of brokenness that the Lord wants. Broken of our sin. It only took a look from Jesus to break through the stubborn and prideful heart of Peter. Jesus turned and looked straight at him. So when you think of that, you know, there's this courtyard, there's this fire, Jesus is over here, Peter is over here, he's being accused of being with Jesus, and then when he denies him the third time, Jesus turns and just looks straight at him. 
It was a time of brokenness that I'm sure Peter never forgot, and we shouldn't forget either. You might have a time like this in your life after you came to Christ when you realized how you were harming the relationship with Jesus like Peter was harming his. Maybe you have not been treating your husband or wife with respect and honor and you realize it and you allow the Spirit of the Lord to stop you like Jesus looking straight at you and you're broken and you grow and you humble yourself and make it right. Or you might be complaining about life to yourself or someone else, simply not trusting God that your particular difficulties or trials, they're just too hard or it's just not fair. So think about the eyes of Jesus. Think about what the eyes of Jesus would have been like looking compassionately, lovingly, strongly into the eyes of Peter. And can you imagine the eyes of Jesus looking straight at you in the midst of your sinfulness or your unthankfulness? So prayer itself, if it is genuine, is brokenness. Think about your prayer life for a minute. When you pray, What's your attitude? Are you taking the time to bring yourself onto the same page as God, giving him all your worldly desires? I was talking with Barb this week about the message a little bit, and she always has such good things to say. And she said, yeah, sometimes I pray, um, you know, I pray for something that I want, and then I say, but, but whatever you do, Lord, but the attitude is, I, can't, I don't know if I can say it like she did, it's like, but whatever you do, Lord, I know you're going to do what you're going to do. That's really not brokenness or genuine prayer, is it? It's not coming in line. It's not really broken. And um, so, um, so our attitude in prayer... You want to be more healthy, maybe, or you want to have some other thing about your life made easier. You aren't being thankful, and you realize that God knows better than you do about what's best for you, and so you come to him in prayer, and you get on the same page as this all-powerful and all-wise, loving creator who brought you to him and made you useful. This is brokenness. And we really should stay in prayer like the psalmist did when the psalmist was pouring out laments, or Job the same way, or lamentations. We should stay in prayer until we're actually thanking God for whatever it is. And we're praising him for whatever he's doing. That's really, that's brokenness like in the psalms. It's good to pour our hearts out to God in honest brokenness, like Job did. Incidentally, if you want to talk to me about Job later, I don't think Job, I, there's, um, I wrote a paper on this in one of my Doctor of Ministry classes. Um, some of the latest research in Hebrew language and some of the latest commentators agree that Job was not repenting in dust and ashes. He was he was, he was um, being comforted. It's interesting how the Hebrew language there is. It's really, and he was comforted and turned from the dust and ashes. And so, because uh, God doesn't accuse Job of anything. In fact, he tells ev the audience there that Job's done nothing wrong. And he restores Job, and he does everything that he would do if somebody had not done something wrong. So Job pouring out himself, and then you read God talking to him. If you look at it this way, God is way more gentle as he talks to Job than we usually hear. We usually hear God said, well, where were you when I created the world? You know, it's like a, but I don't think that was the attitude. I think it was a patient attitude, loving attitude. But we're, we get on his page, 
like the psalmist and like Job and like Lamentations. And this is brokenness, and it should be happening throughout our lives as we grow in our understanding and in our faith. Another way to be on the same page with God is to see others around us the way God sees them. This brings us to the passages in Jeremiah and in Romans. Jeremiah prays, as we've already read, and he allows himself to be broken in such a way that he cares about others the way God cares. So Jeremiah says, You who are my comforter in sorrow, he's pouring out his heart, my heart is faint within me. He's honestly coming to God. Listen to the cry of my people from a land far away. You think God doesn't want to listen to the cry of his people? Of course he does. He's getting on the same page with God. Is the Lord not in Zion? Is her king no longer there? And then Jeremiah writes God's answer, God's voice as he prays. And God says, Why have they aroused my anger with their images, with their worthless foreign idols? So then, turning back to what Jeremiah says in the prayer, the harvest is past, the summer has ended, and we are not saved. Since my people are crushed, I am crushed. I mourn and horror grips me. Are you crushed for your neighbors? Jeremiah is in line with God. He cares about the people to the point he's crushed. Because the people are crushed. And even though it's because of their own sin, the text points out, they're crushed for their own sin. But he's still crushed about it. And he's grieved about it. And he's in line with God about it. So think for, your, for just a minute about your neighbors. What do you think about your neighbors who do not come to God? Are you crushed for Am I crushed for them? Are you broken hearted for them as God is? Prayer for our neighbors should be because we're broken hearted for them. Not so that it'll make our lives nicer because we have Christian neighbors, finally. I think probably more of us are like Jonah who didn't really want to reach Nineveh. And he didn't want them to uh, escape the judgment of God. But even Jonah was broken by God to go. And Paul also seems to be broken in the same way as Jeremiah as he writes in Romans 9 as we read earlier. I speak the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race. So that's dramatic. And once again, this is Paul getting in line with God and caring about God's people and Paul's people, the people of his own race, he calls them. And he was an apostle to all the other races of people. He wasn't an apostle to the Jewish people, but he was an apostle to the other races, and uh, they were the Gentiles, everyone that's not Jewish. But here he's broken over his own people, so we need to ask ourselves if we are broken. I'm not saying I'm broken enough. None of us probably are broken enough. But we need to ask ourselves if we're broken over the people in our families and in our neighborhoods and if we're in line with Jesus in all this. Barb and I have been praying for many years and our kids have all their lives been praying for Barb's mom come to know Christ and they prayed all their lives for her dad who passed away several years ago and we have some hope that he trusted Christ also but praying uh, for her to come to Christ so now it appears that she has she said a few weeks you know some weeks back maybe a month or so back to one of Barb's sisters that she knew she needed the forgiveness of Jesus kind of the way it was reported to us she was on a hospital bed and now she has like heart failure and she now doesn't want to take the medicine. And so she's fine if she goes. And she says she knew she needed the forgiveness of Jesus. And said, when we saw her in Arizona last week, uh, I got to see a different attitude. And um, for all the time I have known her, 43 or so years, um, Barb and I are just about to be the 42nd uh, anniversary here in June. She had just a noticeably hard heart whenever Jesus or the gospel was mentioned and she would say things like I haven't done anything wrong 
or I'm a Catholic, so leave me alone. And by the way, she was only taken to the Catholic Church maybe once or twice as a girl. She was never Catholic. But this time, she was talking with Kristen. Uh, we were at her home, and um, uh, she said that she prayed now every day. She said this to Kristen. Kristen told me later. She prays now every day that she'll do what God wants her to do. I mean, we're not sure why she was saying that to Kristen, but then I walked up, and I didn't know what she had said, and she turned to me, and she repeated the same thing emphatically. <clears throat> you know, it took some doing to, to put it out there, and she said, she said the same thing. I uh, pray. I pray every day. It's hard to explain the emphasis that I do what God wants me to do. So my response was, well, be sure at the same time to be thanking God for his forgiveness in Jesus. So I wanted to be sure she didn't think she was earning or that she was. So uh, she said, she had then, in response to that, a humility that I have never seen in her. And she said she is. And that's a brokenness. The, uh, the whole attitude I've always seen was changed. There was a humbleness. In fact, the whole time, she, she took us all out to a Mexican restaurant for lunch and drove up in her van. Here she is, 89, and almost on her deathbed. But she, uh, she, the whole time, she was a different person. And Kristen said later that uh, Joe, he, she told Joe that he had met a completely different person than the person Kristen has known all of her life. Because there, she's broken to be humble now when the subject of the gospel comes up. She wants to let you know. And she doesn't know, she doesn't have the Christian terms, but it seems that she's come to Christ. Instead of prideful hardness, there's humility and softness, and that's the brokenness that God brings. And Jesus talked about this in a parable. And as I read this, uh, remember, Barb's mom thought earlier she hadn't done anything wrong. And she thought somehow being a Catholic as a kid got her in. And here's what Jesus said in Luke 18, beginning in verse 9. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. So the Pharisee thought he didn't do anything wrong. He thought that his religious practices of fasting and tithing got him in, but it didn't. Jesus continues in the parable and he he describes a humility that comes from a brokenness. And so here it is. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Those who are broken will be exalted. Those who remain in the, you know, I didn't do anything wrong, I'm better than this other person, they will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. That's a brokenness. When we pray, we don't come with our own righteousness. We recognize we only have his. That's it. No matter how mature we think we are. All of us are saved by grace through faith, and guess what? All of us serve by grace through faith. A pastor can only answer the call by grace through faith. You know, I wrestled with the call and finally realized that. Well, I just have to realize I'm never going to be mature enough. I'm never going to know enough. I'm never going to, you know, so the call was there. And I said, I answered it by grace through faith, knowing that God would you know, so that was a breaking in the call. 
I'm looking at somebody who knows what I'm talking about back there. It's a brokenness. We need to be bringing ourselves in line with God in everything as we pray. This message is about prayer and bo brokenness. And I started out saying we need to be on the same page as God to be able to see and know his blessing. And when we cry out to him in our troubles and brokenness, he brings us close to him, like the psalmist and Job and Lamentations. But here's an example from my life. So most of you have met our daughter. Many of you, you know, almost everybody here has met her. She's 38, and you mostly know she was 22 when she was diagnosed with MS, but it didn't slow her down at the time. She was young, and she was diagnosed. Barb wasn't affected very much. Barb had been diagnosed a year and a half earlier, and Barb was not getting the weaknesses. Barb was also taking medication, which seemed to stop the progression. Kristen was very active as a young person. She went on many mission trips, uh, sometimes whole summer, and uh, served in youth ministries. When I was pastor in San Diego, she took the youth out on uh, Wednesday nights into the yard and at youth ministries, um, you know, kicking a ball around, things like that. Uh, loving life. And if you know her now, she loves life. If you've met her, you're bowled over by how much she loves life and her attitude uh, even though she needs a mobility device uh, when she goes out of the house. She rides a scooter that folds up in the car. So at 24, uh, she had some episodes of weakness, and then suddenly she couldn't walk at all, not even like she can now. And so we didn't know how long that would be. Uh, in an effort to uh, be able to walk again, uh, she'd go with Barb out to the mailbox uh, every day. Uh, Barb would get her and they would it would take you know I don't know a half hour to walk out to the mailbox and back and she began some swimming therapy she could get in the water and uh, move around in that way and so very slowly over the course of a year she was almost back to normal way better than she is now and so uh, she moved back out to live with some girlfriends but when she could not walk uh, I prayed with her one day um, very uh, soon after she could not walk, and we were sitting there on the couch that she spent the day on, and I, I prayed that I could dance with her at her wedding. You might have heard me say that before. But um, we said in the prayer together that we could see how God uses people even more when they shine through trials. But we still prayed that I could dance with her at her wedding. That was actually a remarkable prayer because I had always told my kids that, you know, the way conservative Bible believers dance is like this. <laughs> and I had never been to a wedding where the dance didn't degenerate. So I was really not happy that there might be a dance at a wedding. But uh, so I was praying that I could dance with her at her wedding. So she's given her permission if she gets married. So, uh, so it was her desire. She was strongly and is committed to walking with Christ. And um, she probably uh, took me serious when she was a teenager. And I told her she couldn't date till she was 27. But she met Joe, I think, at 25 and got married at 27. She was already weak, but um, she also knew that now if God gave her a husband, he would have to be awfully soft-hearted. You can't find a softer heart than Joe. So from the beginning, she trusted that God had a purpose for her trials, even if they would be for the rest of her life. And that's humbling yourself, knowing God knows better than you do. Sometimes if you... You know, sometimes I've asked her, you know, how is it really? And, you know, it's, I've only seen her once where it's hit her. But normally she's strong in the Lord. And she points to everything that God has done through all of this. And she encourages everyone else. And I could go into a lot of details, but, you know, one of the greatest parts of the story is I got to dance with her at her wedding. 
And by the way, God gave her quite a wedding there in Montana because the Montana University, which is these gorgeous buildings of over 100 years old, you can rent their hall for $100. <laughs> so, and then everybody that eats, you know, they ser use the students to serve the meals, and it's like $11 a piece. So she had like a $40,000 wedding for $5,000, which is budget I had given her when she was a teenager. It should have been raised, but I never raised it. So if you see the pictures, you'll know that's not what it looks like. But so Kristen will tell you if you ask her the blessing that's come from surrendering in brokenness and humility to what God has for her. And she would not trade it. You can ask her. She won't trade it. And James says in James 4, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Or you can replace this by shows favor to the broken. Submit yourselves then to God. Be broken like a wild horse. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. In other words, be broken. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Be crushed over um, your neighbors. Uh, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. So a question, and by the way, that's quoted by Peter. It comes from the Old Testament. It's quoted by another prophet in the Old Testament. It's four times in the Bible. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. There may be others, but I know of four. So the question is, what, what will he lift you up for? And here's the answer. He will lift you up as he lifted Jesus up to be surrendered in service. That's, think about that. He's going to lift you up for what? To do what he's changed your heart to want to do. To serve him. To give it all to him. Jesus is the one lifted up. Jesus sur surrendered all strength and all power in service to us as he laid down his life on the cross. And we should be broken by this and we should lay down our lives. We should be like the wild horse, broken by the skilled cowboy, to become useful and enjoy the relationship. We should be broken to care for those around us like Jesus cares. So let's close our eyes a minute. We'll do something different here rather than just a prayer at the end of the message. Close our eyes and bow our heads and ask yourself, do I long for those outside of Christ to know Christ? Do I want to shine in my trials so that God can use me in a greater way? Think about that for a minute. Do I trust that God knows best with me in whatever suffering I find myself in? Think about that for a minute. Am I honest with God like the psalmists and Job to let it out with God and to turn my uh, pouring out into praise? And a final question, where do I need broken today? I'm going to let you think about that for about 30 seconds, which is a long time in prayer. Where do I need broken today? Lord, keep us broken as a church as a body, humbly wanting your future for us, not latching on to a future that you might not have in mind, but just wanting your future keep us as a church broken and keep me um, breaking every day, humbling before you, keep all of us focused on your love 
and grace and powerful care which brought us around in the first place. Help us to be fixated on that, uh, broken from the things of the world, uh, to be poured out uh, to you and uh, to be poured out in service as Jesus gave the example of being lifted up for service because we're broken. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.